you just introduce yourself. And this is going to be more of a um, question and answer kind of setup this time. So it's a little different than what we've done in the past. And then if there are any questions from the audience, please let us know. Um, you can either unmute yourself and talk, or you can just type it into the messenger. So, Jane. I don't know how to. How are you doing? Um, very good. Happy to be here and talk with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So if you can just tell us a little about yourself, um, about your background, and how you came to things. Is that a loaded question? No. <laughs> um, I'm Jane Dixon. I'm an artist, and um, I'm originally from Chicago, but I came to New York in a long time ago, 1970s. Seven, I think, and um, I I never actually planned to be a teacher. I sort of thought I didn't want to be a teacher, but people have consistently asked me to teach. Um, as an undergrad, I went to Harvard, and the year I graduated, I was hired back as a teaching assistant, and I thought, oh, no, <laughs> but this is a real job. I better keep stay in Boston another year, so I did that. Then I came to New York, and I thought, I'm never going to teach again, but I've taught at um, Cooper Union, SCA, SUNY Purchase, Tyler School of Art, and done visiting lectures at Cal State Northridge. And done visiting lectures at many, many places. And um, I got invited to come give a talk at Pace and Pleasantville in, I think it was 99 or 98. And then there was, I saw a job listing in 2000. And I called my, um, I think I called Barbara Friedman, who's a tenured art faculty here, and said, Is this a real job listing? Because often, People list jobs that they already know who they're hiring, but they have to. Yep. She goes, oh, it's my, I'm, I'm going on sabbatical. It's for me. And if you get the thing in tomorrow, we'll, um, your application, that's when we're meeting. So I <clears throat> did that, and I was Barbara's 10-year replacement in 2000. And then um, they kept hiring me back, and gradually I became the artist in residence. <laughs> so tell us exactly what an artist in residence is. Well, an artist in residence at Pace, I teach two classes a semester, so four classes a year, and um, I organize a panel called Careers in the Arts every semester because <clears throat> as a parent of children who now recently finished college, I thought I want my students to have some employable skills. This is what every parent of college-age children is hoping that they're paying for um, mm -hmm. increasing their child's employability. And with some um, careers, it's clear either you pass the, the GRE test or whatever that law school test is, mm -hmm. or you don't. You know if you've accomplished it, whereas the arts, there is no one clear path. So um, what I try to do with Careers in the Arts is invite lecturers who are doing interesting things with their art background, other than being a painter or being a sculptor, um, so that people can consider um, careers that they might never have heard of. Um, this coming March, the Careers in the Arts panel will be um, two speakers who are combining art with fashion. One is a designer for Eileen Fisher, which is a nice brand. My friend Helen Oji, who's a painter and was hired by Eileen Fisher like 15 years ago, and she didn't really have fashion background, as I understand, but um, she goes to Turkey and looks at, you know, organic cotton, mm -hmm. you know, which is the right kind of cotton yeah. for Eileen Fisher to use. And she's about to go to Japan and study with um, traditional indigo dyers mm -hmm. in Japan so that when Eileen Fisher does indigo, it can be bought up. Yes. Ooh. And the other person on the panel is, um, I like to have someone who's 
mid-career, very established, and then someone who's just a little bit older than the, than our students, so they can talk about what it's like to get a first job mm -hmm. in this field today. So the second speaker will be Charlie Pardon, who's a um, does digital tech for high-end fashion photographer. Oh, that's awesome. So I hope they'll come to it. Oh, yeah, of course. And, and we're trying to record these now so that they will be available to within the university. They mm -hmm. can't be broadcast. We don't have permission from the speakers for that. But um, so that if you happen to have a work or have a class that conflicts with the lecture, you can still see it later and find out, right. you know, what courses you would need if you wanted to be a digital tech for fancy fashion shoes that get flown all over the world. Everybody loves to be fancy and <laughs> fashionable. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us about your work and what inspires you. Um, I've been a representational painter using unusual materials primarily. Um, I do sometimes right. paint them, um, with oil and linen, but primarily I paint on unusual materials that I select because of the surprise value and the references of that mm -hmm. material. Um, I used to always say that I work from fear. There's a little bit of a dark side to my work often, but it's not so much true as it was before. But I do, I do work, I make paintings of things I'm thinking about that I'm not clear what I think of. So I consider painting a way to understand the world and hopefully hold a mirror up to the world in a way that other people can see reflections of themselves and think about their life. So I'm interested in how my personal experience um, reflects a broad experience. And for example, when I did the um, mosaics in the for the MTA mm -hmm. in Times Square, and I had worked on several projects with the MTA, and I lived and worked in Times Square it's 1978. That must be. That must be crazy. Well, I started working there on the first computer, computerized light board that was at one Times Square when they dropped the ball. Awesome. In 78, I entered an ad in the newspaper where they said, we want to train an artist to work with computers, because at that point, there was no such thing as computer art programs in any school. <laughs> Because they said, We've we have this new computer light board, but we've discovered that you can't teach art to a computer person. <laughs> so we want to teach computer skills to artists. Um, which was ironic, because at the time I didn't even know how to type. Because I thought, I'm an artist, I don't need to type. Never. So I quickly, I said, they said at the end, they went, we love you, you can type, of course. And I said, oh, of course. And I ran right out and got to <laughs> teach yourself to type book. And I sat there and practiced till my hands were... You know, going into convulsion. <laughs> um, so I started wor working there in 78, then I moved there in 81, lived there till 80, 93 when our building got demolished. For, um, the Times Square redevelopment, but I got kept a studio there on and off till <clears throat> 2008. So while I was working on these mosaics, I also had a studio on business. Anyway, when they invited me to do the, to propose a project for the subway, um, I had done a series of paintings of New Year's Eve revelers because we, first of all, when I worked at the billboard, I ran the sign on New Year's Eve. That was my job. That's so cool. And looked out and was like, oh my God, there's this old. And then the years when I didn't run the sign, we lived on 43rd between 7th and 8th, which was closed off as part of Times Square. So you had to decide by like 6 p.m. on New Year's Eve if you were going to be in or out. Because if you were in, you were stuck till 10 a.m. the next morning. And if you were out, you could not get back to the police, according to our house. 
So some years I'd be there and be listening to this <laughs> of those horns. At a certain point, they start to seem like deranged sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can hear that. <laughs> and you know it's fun for a while, but people start really early and they go oh, really. Of course. You, know, you got people staggering around at 9 a.m. still sitting. Um, so I had done a series of paintings of it partly to see what it was that people were attracted to by getting in these crazy crowds that I'm, I'm afraid of crowds. So, so it fit into my concept of fear. Yeah. But then when they asked me to, to propose something for the subway, it was around the time of the London subway bombing. So I was afraid of the subway then. I mean, okay. everyone was, the subway was a more, um, psychically loaded space than it normally is and normally it's not the most happy place no. you can imagine you know when you go oh my god this reminds me of the subway at rush hour you're not picturing a good thing right? no usually not <laughs> and the tunnel between port authority and times square is traversed by they say a hundred thousand people a day yeah and if you ever That's try true. to stop in that tunnel even when it's not rush hour it's not possible. I, when I was trying to plan it, I would, and I did this the other day, I walked through it and I was like, oh, I'm going to take a picture of one of my most bags. If you stop, it's, it's kind of like blocking up a pipe, you yep. know? People just, they don't push you, but there's such a force. They just move slowly nudge you. That you cannot stand still. So it's like, hmm, how am I going to make art that people cannot stop to look at? And don't want to stop to look at it because everyone's trying to get to one train station or the bus station and they're in a hurry. And um, So I thought, well, I want to return to the reveler idea because New Year's Eve is one of the things that Times Square is known for around the world. Very much so. Um, and, um, and I thought I want to connect commuters who are hurried and harried and tired and stressed with that other part of themselves that, you know, when they're joyful and playful and they're with their friends and they're celebrating and having a good time. Um, so I thought I'm going to have all these figures will be hurrying toward, they'll be hurrying east from Port Authority towards Times Square. And then in the lower mezzanine under the one, two, and three train, they're all jumping up and down like it's New Year's Eve. And then up by the six train, there's a picture of a man my husband posed for it, looking at his watch. Like, is it, is it time yet? Can we go home? <laughs> so I was trying to explore all the different um, emotions that one feels around that, the positive emotions. Um, I thought, ooh, in this case, we're all familiar enough for the, you know, the sort of bluesy side of New Year's Eve. I don't need to, I do not want to add to anybody's um, unhappiness in the subway. It's already a challenging situation. I want to give people something that they can have sort of a yeah, you know, yeah, no. idealized fellow travelers who are cheerful. Yeah. So I made them in bright colors. Um, one of the things I did is I went to New Year's Eve in Times Square a couple of years and tried to photograph people, but it's so crowded that I could only get from the shoulder up and I needed full figures. So I bought a lot of hats and horns and I asked various people to pose for me, including some of my stu drawn class students who were up for it, to try to get as big of a range of age and gender and ethnicity as I could. And what I discovered, which I never had known before, is if you give somebody the symbols of amusement and ask them to pretend that they're having fun, they do. So you go, here's a bag of silly hats and horns and noisemakers. Can you just move around for a minute and I'll take a few pictures of you? And people would get really into it and go, how about this? And what if I do this? And, and then I go, it's great. I got it. Thank you. And they go, but what if I, you know, yeah, I'm having a, it, it would create a party every time. And I was like, really? It's that simple to get people to. Such a positive reaction. Yeah. That I, I held on to those heads and horns for quite a while. Oh, that's wonderful. So, um, 
Have you done any other work with the MTA? Um, the MTA did a series, and they, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they did a series starting at least 15 years ago where they had different artists do artworks that they made into a poster for different stations. <laughs> and because they knew that I lived and worked in Times Square and had done a lot of paintings of Times Square and I'd done a show of those paintings at the Whitney Museum at Philip Morris and um, the Brooklyn Museum has one of my paintings of Times Square up on permanent exhibit in the American section. Yes, I'm very happy. I'm in the Ashcan section. I'm in with all these dead guys from the early 20th century, mm -hmm. 100 years ago. You're the most fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the, most, I'm the last one standing. <laughs> I'm not as old as those guys. I was. I didn't know any of them, but I admired them. Um, so when it was time to ask an artist to do Times Square, they thought of me. And they um, commissioned me to do a poster of Times Square, which was, um, you know, put in all the subways for a few years. And then I got asked to be on a couple of panels for the, they, they, when they, when they're commissioning other artworks, they always like to have an artist on the panel. They'll have people from the community, people from the, um, from the transit authority and whatever, somebody from the government and whatever stakeholders they can think of, but they always have at least one artist so they can get that perspective as well. So I was, I've been on a couple of their panels and I think that's partly a way that they can start to see if someone is uh, easy to work with, or put it this way, maybe not easy, but not unreasonably difficult yes. to work with. Because artists, oddly, can be sometimes not the most, you know, they have their vision and they're not as flexible. as. And with public art, you have to be flexible. It's not yes. all me and my vision. It's how can I work with the needs of the the MTA itself, and then of the passengers, and of the people that are going to have to maintain it, and the list is vast of who has a stake in this, and and I have to, I, I believe it is the artist's job to try to adapt my vision in a way that's agreeable to as many of those people as possible. You know, it's like their job is already hard at the MTA. They don't want a controversy. You know, some artists like controversy, and it's like, deal with this. And, you know, as we know, there was the Tilted Arc, Richard Serra sculpture that mm -hmm. used to be in this neighborhood, and while I love a lot of Richard Serra's work, as someone who had to pass across the plaza that he had blocked with his sculpture. I was like, every time I went by, I thought, I want to kick this. <laughs> I know it'll break my toe because it's steel, but it's in my way. You know, and I, I think art is, you know, art is really valuable, but um, obstructing passage is not a good use not the, of it. Not the goal of it. <laughs> or at least it's not my goal. No, that's, that's very interesting. So with we have the public art. What do you do for if, let's say, you've been commissioned for a private piece? Do you do that or do... I do it um, not as much as I'd like, but of course. <laughs> I did do a big commission for Radio Shack. This was a while ago, maybe eight, six or eight years ago, um, where they were... Um, building a new corporate headquarters, I think it's in Texas, and they wanted um, to commission original art that all related to Radio Shack. And one of the other things that I had done after after our um, Times Square was cleaned up and we moved down to Tribeca, not too far from here, I was like, hmm, I used to be able to just look out the window and find all these, you know, extreme street scenes to paint. Tribeca, not that much happening to paint, so what am I going to paint? And then I um, 
Well, I was, it actually was when I started teaching at Pleasantville, I was driving up to Westchester and back every day, and I go, oh my God, the, the light over the river is so beautiful, and the tunnel, and the bridge, and so I started, um, I took pictures, I didn't look through the camera, and I know this is crazy, but I did do it, I snapped some pictures, and sometimes I would carpool with another faculty, and I took a lot of pictures that way. And I did a whole series of highway paintings on AstroTurf. Because that way I could use the the nature texture of green as the sort of green blur of the the, the trees as you're zooming past. Because I really wanted to paint the high this sort of hourglass shape of the highway and the sky. Um, and so there were these uh, triangles of vegetation on either side. And if I just left that astroturf, you read it as, you know, green blur tree. So um, I had done a whole series of astroturf, so I did, and that led to a whole suburban series because I was like, I'm sick of New York, and I went and taught in California and painted California on astroturf, which New Yorkers all go, yeah, L.A., AstroTurf, I get it, whereas people in California go, you don't get it, what's the connection between us and AstroTurf? <laughs> so anyway, I, I painted a radio shack in a shopping mall on, on turquoise blue AstroTurf, it's supposed to represent Ooh. water, but it's also very good for sky, and I, I love it. in turquoise blue. AstroTurf comes in... Every color you can think of. I guess I never really thought about it, though. So. <laughs> Some of them are special order, but it comes in every color. So do you always like to use a three-dimensional kind of piece to in your artwork, or is that just something that depends on the piece? I don't always do it, but I often do it, and I feel like I, I find a material that resonates with a certain subject. So AstroTurf, which is, it, it's a surrogate for nature. And it comes, like I said, it comes in grass color, it comes in sky color or, or water, and it comes in sand, and it comes in gray gravel color. So depending what you, where you put it, where, what you're trying to pretend it is. And it also comes in artificial colors like black. But um so it's a representation of nature. So if I make a, I feel like the, one of the challenges of painting now in the 21st century, but it was also a challenge of the 20th century, is how, what does painting do after photography? That What can painting do that better than a photo of this could do? And one of the things it can do is bring in these concepts and resonances so that my painting of a radio shack on AstroTurf was more dreamy and idealized than the equivalent photo would just be like, yeah, there's a mom and her little kid going into radio shack. Yeah. <laughs> Where somehow it could be more ethereal. Um, and, and I've worked on um, textured vinyl, sandpaper, um, lots of felt, lots of different materials and part of what it does is just refresh the mark so that you don't go yeah it's an oil painting you go what is that and you have to go look at it and then you go oh that's cool I like that so it helps uh, you know reattract people to a static image which today I mean in the 20th century I'd say painting was trying to you know, grapple with photography, and in the 21st century, painting has to really grapple with video. You know, it's like you go through your phone now, like your Facebook, and it's hardly any still images anymore. Yes. It's like, why take a still of that spider if you could do a video of, oh my God, it's crawling up the <laughs> You know, so whatever it is, people are video, so a still image which used to be a normal idea, now it suddenly has to justify itself. So that's something I'm thinking about at the moment. And the mosaics in the subway, because I had started as an animator, 
Um, I thought of them as a kind of animation, but instead of the images moving, the viewer is moving. So I tried to work them, the rhythm through so that when you walk through, it's sort of syncopated and each one is leading to the next yes. one. So well, maybe I'll think happens. of more ways to to bring movement in. I don't think I'm going to become a video maker, but I don't know. I am doing, I did a project a long time ago called City Maze up at an art space in the South Bronx, and I'm going to redo it this summer. Um, and that was literally a labyrinth, so that's another way to get the audience to move through I like the artwork. Oh, I'm you Fabulous. I love it. <laughs> so what's your favorite medium to work in, if you have one? Um, I, I have a question. No, I don't really have a... I don't have a favorite medium. I have some that I'm much more um, fluent in, but I find that when I get really, really good at something and I can be like, oh, yes, I just know if I go, it's going to make this perfect flick, that that's the time to switch. That's part of why I look for these unusual materials because um, and and every artist has their own set of issues to work with and against. And in my case, I studied a lot of um, life drawing and art history. I went to school in Paris, and I'm very skilled technically, but that can be a dead end in itself. So I need to keep going. Like right now I'm working on this surface that sort of looks like cement. It's a textured wall additive that makes sort of Mediterranean mm -hmm. rough surfaces. You, you know, you get it at the hardware store. And the it's hard to paint on. So then I have to really think. I can't do, okay, this is my signature mark. So I feel like in my case, my sort of technical finesse needs to be countered with some, periodically with some new material where I'm like, Oh, this is hard. How, how am I going to make this work? And then after a while, I'll work on this cement material for six months, and I'll be like, oh, this is, you know, I could do this in my sleep. And then I need to switch to another material, and then I'll come back. Like this cement stuff I used actually a long time ago, 1990, I think. And I haven't used it since, and now I'm using it again. And it's interesting to put the new ones with the earlier ones. And go, Damn, I'm a much better painter than I was. I have more, you know, technical control. Um, you like to mix things? Mix materials? Yeah. Not so much. And um, although I'm teaching mixed media this semester, so oh. hopefully I, I, I tend to use one odd material and then acrylic or oil paint on it. I don't pile up many materials. But it's a good, I'm not against it. I just. It's not how you roll. I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> I find if I have, you know, two things, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> totally understand. So I'm going to see if we have any questions from our audience. Do, do any residents have any questions? Okay. Well, I just want to thank you all so much for attending, and I look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you, and have a great day.